just to say uh, afterwards we have lightning talks, but I don't know if anyone has anything, but so you're not really limited. Maybe I think of something while I'm speaking. Yeah, you're not really limited. But no I have no demo. Uh, okay, oh, okay. Yeah. Well, well, I, I will, uh, I, I don't, I'm not even sure that this will uh, take 30 minutes. I, I doubt it won't. So, uh, I doubt it will, so. Uh, this is something uh, that was brought to my attention, uh, brought to my attention, um, and uh, I'm just going to start with the motivating use case. Most of you will probably uh, uh, remember, but it's not the only use case, and this is sort of the thing where you suspend a uh, file system, usually via DM suspend. Uh, this is an example with a DM crypted, a DM crypt device. <coughs> you suspend it, it's frozen, but uh, the data may or remains in the page cache, and then if you read from uh, that slash mount data file, it will still show you uh, the unencrypted data. And uh, I was asked by the GNOME people who use systemd homed, which is an encrypted, a way to encrypt your home device, when they suspend uh, the home volume, is there any way that we can have an API that drops the contents of the page cache, returning an error for this uh, is fine. Um, and I, uh, the obvious answer to this is why don't you use this? Well, because it, it's for all file systems uh, on the whole system. It doesn't report an error, uh, so it's not necessarily always the best API. And it's then, also not guaranteed to drop the page cache either. yeah. Yeah, well, well, I, I get to all of the problems that we, so I collected all of the problems that people pointed out on the thread, and as you know, I'm uh, deeply, deeply experienced in the page cache. <laughs> um, and so uh, a bunch of you uh, provided really good commentary, so uh, reference folios, Jan pointed out, uh, remain pinned, and so dropping the page cache would fail. Uh, those uh, errors could be transient or spurious. Um, what are possible interactions with uh, mlock? Uh, there are cases where some ju stuff just can't be evicted from the page cache. Uh, mapping executable code, for example. Um, if the threat model or the main use case is cold boot attacks, then it's possibly, probably not enough to just drop the page cache. You also would need to zero all memory. That gets you into a, a whole hell of other problems that you probably don't want to be involved in. Um, uh, there is possibly the ability to use security file permissions to it, so instead that dropping the contents from the page cache, that I guess this is how I understood it, before you actually suspend the device, you'd uh, attach a new BPF LSM program, for example, and then all reads uh, would return, I don't know, some sort of error. Um, but uh, apart from the, uh, from the cold boot attack case, uh, I think it's at least worth discussing whether or not an API or some form of dropping the page cache of a specific FS is something that is usable, something that people have a use case for. Uh, I know that I talked to David Howells, who I'm not seeing. Ah. Uh, he mentioned that he would use this for, uh, he thought about something like this for AFS. Um, I uh, talked to Leonard, he would possibly also have a use case for this. So it's at least something uh, to consider, but now please go we, yell at We me. use it for several uh, LTP tests and it's not reliable. We have to like do some gymnastics around it to make it a little bit more reliable. So the API is useful for tests. That's one thing. Oh, I'm just, just gonna point out that Tron has had patches for NFS to do, to drop page cache from individual inodes for, for years. Um, so you might want to... Uh, I think Kent mentioned that bcachefs has something like this for sub-volume deletion. Oh, okay. Yeah, but for, for the NFS, well. it's, it's a, you have to know the actual inodes and IOCuddle, but, uh, but uh, you know, maybe that could be a possibility. If, if you If, if you just want to drop the page cache of an individual inode, there's a POSIX F-Advise uh, interface for that. Yeah, yeah. So there's yeah, yeah. nothing special that we need to do that. Yeah. This is something completely different to that. Yeah. Yeah, so that would, this would be for a, uh, for a whole um, file system. Yeah. You can say it's a dumb idea. <laughs> 
No, I mean, I, I, I can see the use case. It makes sense. It, it is a reasonable thing to want. It's just a hard thing to implement. Because of this slide. Yeah. Yeah. Easy guarantee is hard. Yeah, I mean, we, there, there, there are things we could do with MLock and VM Splice. For example, we could mark the page as no longer being up to date and we could zero it. Assuming we can't evict it, we, we, could, we could mark it not up to date, we could zero it. But, I mean, we've, we've, we've VM Spliced it for a reason, right? Like, it, 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 it's in progress, like, and, or, or we've pinned it. Like, we've, we've given it to an RDMA adapter. And, and that RDMA is going to happen whether, whether the page is up to date or not. And so, yeah, this is, this, this is really tricky because it, it's so weird. But is it, well, okay, making sense. is it okay to just fail? And how likely is it? Like, basically what I'm saying is um, on a normal... On a normal, what is a normal system? Uh, on a system, how likely are you encounter if, uh, if you request drop the page cache of this file system that it tells you go away? You can get 99% of your pages gone. Yeah. So I, I think the issue is that because this was framed as a security feature, yes. right, then everyone starts thinking about the corner cases. Um, I will say that for FScript, we have a best efforts only where when you blow a key out of the key ring, we try to make sure that all the dentries are zapped and then we try to flush out all of the inodes uh, that, belong, that were encrypted using that key. But we didn't even try to handle what would happen if the file was open. And the reason why we didn't was the original use case of FScript was for Chrome OS. And this only happened after you had logged out of your login session. So there weren't going to be any open file descriptors. So we just said, yeah, we're just going to you know, get rid of all the dentries, make sure all the inodes are dropped. And we called it a day. right? And it was not a complete solution. And we never actually advertised it as a guarantee. And so those of us who did the work sort of you know, slept well at night because it wasn't documented anywhere that we were doing it, right? It was a best efforts. We're going to try to get rid of everything, but we're, we're not making any promises. Um, now, I could imagine say, that there might be other uses of FScript beyond Chrome OS where you might want stronger guarantees. And so I'm mentioning this now because I actually just quickly checked and it's like, yep, we just did a half-assed job because it was good enough for Chrome OS. Um, and I think that's really the question, which is if you want a half-assed job, which is mostly good enough, sure, it'll work. If we want to handle all of these corner cases, life gets hard. <laughs> you know? I just, just to put that in a slightly less pejorative way, if you want to make sure that your open office documents are no longer visible, I'm pretty sure we can guarantee that. If you want to make sure that every single file on this file system is no longer accessible, we, we would not see well at night. So this, this is yet another revoke discussion. And we really, really need to get someone to tackle this properly because this keeps coming up all, all over the place. Online FS check has need, needs revoke in, in corner cases. Uh, debug FS, I keep forgetting that that code implements re revoke in a half-baked internal hacky way. <laughs> yeah, so, so I think the API actually makes sense exactly uh, and I think it's perfect for debugging, reasonable for kind of improving the security in some cases. But yeah, uh, like you, you have asked, how, how frequently do you think it's going to fail? And it very much depends on the conditions. Like if you have the user session running out of that file system, then I guess we get failure in 99% of the cases, actually, because there is almost guaranteed to be some pages which we cannot evict. Yeah. If it's some file system which is mostly just sitting somewhere on the side, then usually you, you would expect success because, you know, unless there is somebody just doing I.O. to it right now, then, then we should be able to basically clean it up. So it very much depends on the exact use, which is exactly the reason why I would be kind of reluctant to give guarantees because 
like reliably sorting all the corner cases is difficult. And yeah, as uh, Ken said about revoke, I'm well. It's I don't think it's quite the revoke discussion because like here, what you would like, there are different use cases which have different requirements. Yeah, like, like if you are, for example, executing file from that file system, then then what should happen? Yeah, or that's a proper revoke API would specify the behavior under different situations. There are different situations where you need to try harder or less hard, like maybe killing processes in order to actually shoot everything down. And if we had an API, then we could start clear, cleanly specifying those corner cases instead of just discussing them at every single LSF. Um, so I just wanted to add for the use case and, and what we would like to use it in, in, in a system. The, I guess it's very similar to what uh, Ted was exp uh, talking about. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm fine. I'm t totally happy with the best effort thing, as long as the best effort thing and and a failing thing, right? Like I want that the that uh, all the pages are um, evicted that can be evicted, and the ones that cannot, um, we however learn about in user space so that we know that this uh, case happens. So that you that mean an error? You don't actually learn about the yeah, but I I want that the error is not generated immediately and um, the, the the attempt to get everything out is is aborted. I want that the error is, is just returned at the end of it. So and maybe even with the counters, it tells me how much um, uh, of that actually succeeded, and. Uh, um, yeah, and I, but I would assume though that uh, in almost all cases we will not have a problem with this because we are going to do this per, per user exactly like in the in the Chrome OS thing, and we will um, uh, freeze via C group um, the entire user session first. So there's no user code running at that moment that could keep anything busy. Um, it should just be frozen. So um, yeah, from our perspective, it would be fine. And uh, regarding cold boot attacks, I have a suspicion that if anybody really cares about that, then um, it's probably at the moment where we actually do suspend or um, hibernation or something. Um, these pages should be erased if, if, if uh, that's really desired, not at the moment where where the caches are dropped. I think that should not be conflated into being the same problem. I think there's two distinct problems. Yeah. So Ken, sorry, was your point that uh, revoke and an API like this would exclude each other or complement each other? Uh, it would be useful for a lot of things, including this. Uh, and I think a proper revoke API would have different flags for the situations it's going to be involved with. Like, should it just try to, to remove pages and fail if it would have to kill processes? Should it kill processes? What should we do if, there's, if it's pinned for RDMA? Uh, you could possibly shoot down the mapping on the NIC. But we, we have no framework to start handling those corner cases right now. Yeah, so just one quick note. What we actually ended up doing for FSCrypt is um, we counted the number of inodes that we couldn't evict. And then we print K a message on the console, which I'm sure is completely ignored by everyone except for people who were like Chrome OS developers, that listed the number of inodes that we couldn't evict and one inode number as a sample for people who wanted to figure out what might have been going on. And yeah, half asked, but. That's what we did. <laughs> to answer the question about the bcache FS internal API, yeah, on subvolume deletion, we need to shoot down the page cache for the subvolume being deleted. But that's really to stop write back. We only really need to stop dirty pages. And also, my code doesn't attempt to handle any of these crazy corner cases. So I'm, I'm sure it's there's issues with it. I, if the, I think your point on the thread was it would probably be enough to get something useful uh, uh, for this, not for a revoke API. Cool. Yeah. 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 I, I, we, we don't need to, to implement revoke all at once, but I would, it would be nice if we would start to at least think about the API and start to implement parts of the API in something that makes sense in a wider context instead of doing these hacks all over the place, like debugfs. Okay. Yeah. Stupid question. How do you test for correctness? Sorry, I'm pretty bad here. How, how do you test for correctness? How do you test for correctness for this? Uh, I'm I'm not sure. I un I understand what you're uh, after in this case. What do you mean test for correctness here? Sorry. 
Well, you want a desired outcome, right? And this you mean writing test cases. Yeah, for this, right? So, what what exactly would the, that look like? What's the desired outcome? <laughs> well. <laughs> That the page cache contents are dropped. Just gone. That's it. We just yeah. we're happy with that. So one of the questions I keep having as the discussion goes on is you keep talking about discard the page cache contents. What do we do with dirty pages, dirty folios? If we do this, what do we do with the dirty stuff? Do we just throw it away or do we have to wait for write back? And if we have uh, to report errors, what happens if the error is a write back error rather than a page eviction error? And how does the application know that something like that's happened um, and that error gets propagated to the right place? So there's a, a few really interesting yes. questions yeah. around that. So, so uh, uh, if, sorry, in my mind, what I uh, presuppose probably here is if, that you have frozen the device first, that you have suspended the device first, and so there should be n no dirty pages anymore, right? Yeah, so like, again, I'll, I'll use FSCrypt as an example. Before we blow a key, the first thing we do is we write out all the dirty inodes because the moment we blow the key, you will no longer be able to write back any of the dirty pages and it would be rude to drop them, right? So I think we assume that you can push them out. Um, if you are assuming that user space is no longer active or you've killed all the processes, there's no one to report the errors back to. So again, print case to the console. <laughs> Yeah, well, that, that's kind of my point, is that nobody has actually mentioned what has, you know, the assumption that the file system is already frozen for this, so that nobody can add new... I, the first I, slide. I, I, the first slide had a, a DM or a Lux suspend or something. Oh, sorry, like Ecrypt. Yeah, sorry, I should yeah. have said this. So, yeah, so this, this thing... Uh, yeah, so the Crypt set up Lux suspend will actually freeze the file system yes. through DM. Now, this is the example you've given. You didn't state explicitly that the file system needs to be frozen before it's dropped it, it's or a, what. Uh, so that, that's kind of what I'm getting at, is that rather than assuming people understand what that crypt setup Lux suspend thing actually does. Oh yeah, it, it, on the thread, uh, yeah. I explained this in detail, sorry. The Lux suspend is a, uh, it's essentially just a, a file system, a block device freeze, and so yeah. that calls back into the file system and then yeah, Thanks. you understand what it does. I understand yes. what it does. But in other cases where applications are saying, oh, we just want to drop the page cache, yes. are they going to know that they have to suspend the file system first before they can do that? So, And that's the thing. If you suspend the file system, then you start to open up interesting other problems with, you know, what if it's your root file system and then everything stops working? I mean, yes, but that's like a really stupid thing to do, right? I mean, but that may well be doing that. You know, I mean, if you if you're in the process of suspending the uh, suspending the um, the system, one of the things you've got to do is you might have secrets on the root file system somewhere. You know, you you might be doing the the FS crypt thing of you know throwing the keys away, and so you have mm -hmm. to go and throw the page cache away. So, I mean, while it's all well and good to assume that people know what this means, um, if there is actually a requirement that the file system is frozen before you can actually discard the page case safely, um, that has to be clearly documented yes. in, the, in, the, in the process because there are situations where you really do not want to freeze the file system and then try and do other stuff that might load binaries up off the file system. For example, you know, it wants to do an A time update, which then wants to run a, a transaction, but the file system's frozen, so the transaction stops. Your system's now frozen. You know. It was just an example. There, there are other ways that that sort of thing can happen as well. But you know, um, you know, that, that's kind of my point is that it's not, you know, it's not something that you can just, you know, this will magically work. Sure. Um, it's it's got to be done in a in a, a way that we can actually say yes we can do it this way but again the people who are concerned about this aren't concerned about oh you can still see the executable that happened to be m mapped oh you what you you can still see this page that i happened to pass over my audio management they care about their open office documents they care about their web pages 
the web browser history. I mean, let's, let's be fair. We all care about the web browser history being private. <laughs> Yes, uh, I mean, that, that, that's fine, but in the situation where their home directory, for example, is shared with the root directory, there are limitations on what you can actually do safely in that sort of situation. We don't care that, you know, your executables aren't, aren't removed, but if the f file system is frozen, there's other traps that can happen from there. I mean, this would very much be targeted as system... Uh system level software that hopefully knows what it's doing. But yeah, I mean, we have loads of APIs where we can kill ourselves with. Yeah, so I, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm hearing the various things that can go wrong and might go wrong. I, I'm okay with the 99% solution because it's going to practically improve security for everybody. As long as we don't claim that it's going to be 100% guaranteed and uh, as, as, as you asked for then, you know, we, we, we let you know, hey, eight of the 3,000 pages we had couldn't be got rid of. Now, is, 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 how much information do you want? Do you, do you just want... Okay, so you just want something in D-Message that says something went wrong. Why are we talking only about page cache? Is inode cache not something that you need to hide? Yeah, but oh, is it the only concern? Sorry, is, it what? is page cache data the only concern when you want to? Uh, but but about metadata, is it not con uh, concerned at all? I would like to have yeah, you would like. Uh, it would you mind if you could just like, for example, disconnect the inode cache from this SB and just make all the inodes like stale at this point? Uh, trying to purge the inode cache uh, while the file system is frozen will deadlock. I don't think we actually care about the inode cache. We care about the dcache because the dcache has names in it. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem with that is the dcache holds references to the inodes and that will cause inodes to be reclaimed and it will de yeah, that will deadlock if the, uh, the file system is frozen. <laughs> I mean, it's you have to um, get your wall and shrink the item cache, do the right back before you freeze anything, right? So that's the right order if you actually want to do it. And again, it's, a, it's best efforts because it's really, really easy to pin dentries, like even more so than inodes. But, you know, again, best efforts, right? Uh, you know, again, FS Crypt, we do try to purge out all the dentries before we actually nuke the keys because you know we're trying to do our best, but we don't make any guarantees. So maybe silly question, but is the freezing first just to try to get all of the dirty data written out and then drop the clean bits, right? Yep. Largely the freeze in this situation is to make sure that no data is actually being modified. You know, so. If Essentially, user space is suspended at this point that we're trying to then drop the page cache, make everything secure, and then suspend everything. I was just thinking that um, when I saw the talk title, it was I was thinking like drop caches, but just one file system. And drop caches is, is documented to only do clean pages, right? It says yep. it doesn't touch dirty at all. So, I mean, and if 99% is enough, if like you don't have to freeze, right? You could sync and try to clean as much as you can. and then drop what's clean. Yes. Um, so it doesn't have to be freeze unless you want to be yeah. certain. I didn't even. Uh, uh, I, mean, I suspect in practice what we want to do is have what's suspend do something different, right? And say this is a crypto dependency. Like this is a crypto dependency. Like this is a crypto dependency. Like this is a crypto dependency. And say this is a crypto device. And what we want to do for a crypto device is to do all these extra steps, write everything back, plus the dentries, try to drop as many inodes as possible, right? Um, and just, you know, the point solution for, you know, DM is going to be easier than the general purpose case. <laughs> so this comes back, this comes to something I was thinking on coming into this talk is that, you know, when, if we need to flush page cache and we need to get rid of the dentry cache and we need to get rid of the inode cache in all of them, 
what's the mechanism for actually doing that? Um, at the moment, we really only have uh, one mechanism for ensuring that the page cache, uh, not the page cache, the dentry cache and the inode cache are completely purged. Um, the dentry cache we run uh, shrink, uh, you know, uh, subtree, I think it is, um, and that will then purge the dentry cache, you know, everything that it can out of the dentry cache, um, but that does not purge inodes out of the cache. We then have to have a mechanism that removes inodes from the cache, and at the moment, uh, that's effectively done, you know, the only thing we have that will do that on demand um, is the inode case shrinkers. Um, and at the moment we have no way of actually running a shrinker on demand for a single super block, for example. Um, and so there may be mechanisms there. Now, when we run uh, drop caches, um, that basically tells the, the, the memory reclaim code uh, to run all the shrinkers until the shrinkers say there's nothing left to shrink. And it just runs everything over and over and over again until there's nothing left. There's no mechanism for saying run just this shrinker. Um, but it also gets much more complex in that the inode cache is uh, MemCG aware. So not only do we have to flush the, the LRUs, the global LRUs for the inode cache, we also have to walk all the, MC, the, the MemCGs and flush their LRUs for both the dentry cache and the, the, the uh, inode cache. So there's a... There's a, a the actual implementation, when you start talking about all, flushing all of the file system caches, starts to become a lot more complex, a lot more nuanced in what we can actually do. I mean, we do have another way of shrinking all of these things, and that's unmount. And why aren't we just why why why, why do these people why can't these people just unmount this file system? Yeah, uh, be, because they're about to suspend the system to RAM, and they. The app user applications are likely still running, um, and when they bring the out of suspend, um, you want your applications still to be running in the same state that they are running with the same data available and everything like that. And we can't unmount at that point in time, unless we start killing processes and doing things like that. So a slightly different question for you here. What's the mechanism that you would like to actually perform these kinds of administrative commands on a file system? Like, can we actually FS pick or FS open or whichever one is the one that deals with mounted file I, systems and then go r run administrative yeah. commands on them? There was a, the original, um, after I uh, uh, started this thread, I looked around and there was a, there was already a, a patch sent for this, for, for functionality like this a long time ago. Uh, that was rejected based on uh, this is just a toy use case, so probably no need to do this, and that used POSIX F advice uh, as a mechanism to do this, and that seemed pretty straightforward to me. I, I, I just, I mean, just as an API choice. There, there's, I just realized there's some overlap here with another feature that we want, or it'd be really nice to provide, which is uh, live VM migration or live file system migration. Uh, at BcacheFS, we're getting ready to provide really good send and receive and synchronous send and receive. This plus synchronous send and receive would allow us to migrate a container and the file system it's running on to another host while in use. We do this on, uh, so this is similar to the ButterFS send, of, uh, send and receive. Yes, yeah. yes, except uh, does ButterFS do it synchronously? Cool. Do it. I think that's how I implemented migration on uh, container migration with ButterFS oh, as nice. a storage backend. Because I, I sort of have a use case, which is right now the way that online repair works for XFS is that we open the root file system or the root directory, and then we start issuing ioctals to it, which means that the entire file system is pinned in memory and you can't unmount it and you can't take it out of the directory tree at all. It would be nice that we could have some way to make it so that at least if you tried to unmount the file system, something could poke us to say, hey, get off the file system, go away. And I kind of thought that FSPIC might be a better place to have the entry point to all of the online repair stuff since that's file system wide administration anyway, but I never really got around to figuring out if that's really possible to do that with the new 
mount system FS whatever system calls because there's no documentation for them, so I don't know what they do. Oh, I have a lightning talk then. My initial thought for that is, does FA notify have an unmount notification? We need that. Yeah, um, was already asked for. Actually, Christian used that uh, in one of the tests. I notify has that. FA notify does not yet have it, but it can have it. Um, it's not strictly an unmount uh, notification. It's a uh, it's super block destruction notification, destruction, effectively, which right? is exactly right now, what I you mean, want. We kind of want both, I think. I mean, uh, some people want unmount and some people want uh, destroy. Unmount even for a bind mount, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, th this is the implement. List Nowadays it would be super nice because you could also yeah. send out the 64-bit uh, mount ID. Yeah, that's, that was the general idea, but. Like, in principle, implementing this is easy. Yeah? We would basically just define new FA notify event and then call into FA notify in unmount path to generate the event. So, easily doable, I would say, if we decide to go that way. And similar with the super block notification, where in that case we even already have the hook in place. So, we just have to define the event in FA notify for this. But yeah, I, I know that there were some uh, some wishes for this notification somehow happening on the uh, FS in, uh, info files, yeah, or, or for on the file like or like someone wanted to pull the li the file with the list of mounts, yeah, for for this information or whatever, but. I'm not sure if that's the API we want to support or, or, we, or if we just want to really rely on FA Notify for this. But we are kind of going into very different direction than this st talk started about. So, so I agree with, with respect to, to this reclaiming, I agree that actually making Dentry and inode reclaim per superblock is going to be interesting. Although I, I think we currently have the per super block LR use, don't we? Because because the shrinkers are per super block these days. Just for For the use case that you wanted this, I just want to know, is the file system just mounted or is there any overlay of FS over that, Leonard? Okay. Just so you know, if there's overlay of FS above, <laughs> it's more <Yeah>. complicated. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for the stacking file system. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, to go back to shrinkers and per super block shrinkers, um, the shrinker is already per super block and so realistically uh, we can probably invoke that uh, directly from whatever, as long as we've got the super block, um, we could invoke the shrinker directly just by creating our own shrink control structure and setting it up correctly and then calling the, uh, the, the shrink mechanism. Um, so we could do that. Um, it's not that difficult to do. Uh, the mechanism is largely already there to be able to do that. Um, I've actually been looking at that as something that, uh, as a better way to, to uh, you know, essentially implement drop caches because um, that's kind of a bit of a hack um, in the way it works. And it's only single threaded and when you've got, you know, a few hundred million cached inodes and so on, drop caches takes somewhere in the order of 15 minutes to run. Um, so, and that, that's a significant problem for the benchmarking that I do and, and stuff like that. So the benchmark takes, you know, for example, um, five minutes to create, you know, 250 million inodes on XFS, and it takes 15 minutes for drop caches to remove them from cache. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's mechanisms there that we can use to do 
um, uh, purse block shrinking. Um, there's mechanisms that we can use to say, you know, shrink on this node only, shrink on that node only, and whatnot. So we do have the ability to, to you know, have a syscall come in and say, shrink the caches on this, you know, super block, um, and then have it walk the, the super block inode list and throw all the, 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 you know, walk the mappings and throw everything out, and then call the shrinker itself uh, for that super block and throw the dentry cache and, and, uh, and inodes out. Um, so, yes, we can probably do that. Um, you know, it's just a small matter of code, really. I'm just thinking that whether the shrinker even like the right uh, solution we should be invoking for this, like whether we shouldn't really invoke something like what's happening on unmount, yeah? because like with shrinkers, there is the inherent problem that like the, their primary use case is memory reclaim. So, so we don't care about like reclaiming stuff that is still pinned, but with these objects, uh, it is the problem that like then three spin inodes uh, before shrinker actually reclaims these we have to cycle the inode through the LRU similar with the dentries actually before you reclaim them we have to cycle them through the LRU which makes the uh, current drop caches inherently unreliable because depending on whether you are lucky enough to reclaim from other slab caches uh, it determines whether you will try in another round, which will start reclaiming the dentries because the first time you call the shrinkers, it has just cycled like f some dentries to, through the LRU and like cleaned the reference bit. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, exactly. I, I'm, I know you know this very well, but I'm like repeating for the others that basically just thinking out loud that I've been dealing with these problems when I wanted to make drop caches reliable and it has like lots of issues. So, so maybe when we go for API like this, we might think about re-implementing it with something saner. <laughs> Yeah. So for, for something like this, we would be doing things like shrink, shrink sub, subtree to clean out the dentry cache and release all of the references and so on. But that doesn't free the dentries. That just puts them onto the LRU. Um, so we still need to cycle through the LRU, freeing um, all of those things to actually get them out of memory. Um, and so even while they're on the LRU, they still pin the inode. So we've got to clean up the, the, the dentry cache and release them so that... Uh, Yeah, there, 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 there's mechanisms for that as well. Um, so, but yeah, that, that's a, you know, it's part of the solution. It's not the entire solution. I also just realized for, for even noticing the kinds of issues with shrinkers not being reliable, we're still lacking per superblock counters for number of dentries, number of inodes. We only have system-wide counters. And I have patches for that. I, I should post them. I've never noticed that because we've got per file system counters for XFS for that. Of course. I, I guess it also begs the question, why not always use this, let's say if this does get implemented when we freeze any file system? Yes. Uh, the thing is that it would be possible, but it would have to be a new AOCTL. We can't retroactively pump this into yeah. Uh, we d really don't want to be dropping the page cache on any uh, freeze. Uh, freeze is used for backups and stuff like that. So we don't want to, you know, the idea is, is that, you know, you freeze, take a snapshot, um, unfreeze. It should be as short a time as possible. And you don't want to throw out gigabytes of cache just because somebody decided it's time to take a snapshot. Um, but it could still be interesting yeah. to have a combined IOCTL for this, like block layer uh, IOCTL, I think. Yeah. There's there's a few things that freeze could do. Um, you know, I'm not sure whether it takes a flag operate flag field or not at the moment, but uh, you know. Yeah. So yeah, similar to the fact that freeze uh, stops new writers and, and then uh, write back, then I could imagine a similar IOCTL that would stop all access and then evict cache. So you don't want new readers while you're evicting your cache. Yeah. 
we don't have the instrumentation in the code to be able to do that. Um, all Everywhere where we do a, a, a write or a modification has hooks for freezing to work. So if we were to extend that to be any access, um, we'd have to have hooks through the entire file system API to stop pretty much any access um, at that point. So whether it be instrumenting all of the syscalls or something like that, the current freeze codes doesn't do that. And there's a lot of work in that. Yeah, we have a few permission hooks, but not on all of them. I, I was about to joke. I mean, it's not that like that we lack hooks in the VFS. <laughs> I mean, we just don't have enough. I think. Option E. as we start, you know, trying to improve how good of a job it will do, right? It's the moment we say this is a security guarantee that, like, everyone's going to have eyes. Is that what happened when the ADA people decided to implement discarding? Yeah. Um, just on what API we use, I would strongly suggest we use a brand new API, probably a syscall, um, just so that it's not uh, tied to freeze or any of these other things that we're doing. And so that allows us to implement it internally however we need to to be able to do that. And then we can change the implementation as necessary in future. If we go through the freeze API, then we're stuck with it actually doing a freeze. Um, and in future, we may not need to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I turned it off and on again. Uh, uh, okay, uh, thanks for the uh, discussion, it was really helpful and uh, for supplanting my uh, page cache knowledge that doesn't exist really. Um, I have a lightning talk then. Um, so I, I hear people are complaining about uh, the lack of uh, mount API uh, man pages. Um, that is a valid complaint, uh, and one that I had tried to rectify quite a few times. Oh, God. One second. There we go. Give me a second. Ah. Uh, so David written, uh, has written a bunch of those man pages and I simply lack the time to upstream it to the proper man pages project because it takes a really long time. Um, but uh, I've kept them all up to date at least. Uh, I've made my life easier by converting them into markdown so it's just a matter of converting them back to graph. There is a command where you can actually do this so uh, you really need to push me on actually getting this upstream but um, everything that we sort of did, even newer stuff, because we, we actually added quite a, f uh, quite a few new things uh, over the last couple of releases. So for, uh, for fsconfig, when actually creating a super block, we uh, added a new flag that is called fsconfig command uh, create exclusive, which is similar to fsconfig uh, command create. fsconfig uh, command create uh, creates a new super block or recycles an existing one uh, silently, which is a very common problem that I guess many of you might have encountered. So it means you can specify all the mount options that you want if uh, most file systems don't really check for mount options compatibility. So if uh, sget in the VFS finds a super block for that file system on that device, it's like, yay. If it's uh, read-write and the existing superblock is read-write and it's like, oh, I'm just going to reuse that one, you never learn that all of your mount options have been uh, ignored, essentially, uh, which has been a big issue. So we added an extension to fsconfig that allows you to avoid that. It gives you an error when it finds an existing superblock, so you can at least be sure on the uh, VFS level that you're not recycling, silently recycling uh, the same superblock, aka you're getting a bind mount without you wanting to do this. And there's a bunch of extensions in uh, move mount that we did as well. So these are the man pages, they're all up to date. I didn't have the time to upstream them yet, so 
they exist in a private repository. So uh, really, if uh, yeah, we should upstream them. Um, how many of you have actually programmed with the new Mount API for tests or for? Okay, Joseph, yeah. But I guess so there is not a lot of people that have experience like with the functionality and the stuff that you can do and. Yeah, so I had to do the um, mount inside of a namespace thing. Uh, that was horrifying, by the way. Um, so I had, I couldn't, like, there were no mount, I couldn't find these man pages, so I ended up having to, like, Google around and find code and do it. Uh, one ask that I have that's, like, slightly adjacent to this is, can we clean that up somehow? Because, like, the mechanism for doing that is a so so what what exactly are, what do you want to do so like I want to mount an NFS share inside of a container that has its own network namespace, and so what you have to do is outside of the container you have to create the super block, then you have to what you have to fork put yourself in the new network namespace pass the FD into that thing do the attach. Like, do you have it up here? Yeah, so I followed yours, but I was, like, I, yeah, so this one, but I, it doesn't cover everything. So there are. You have to do the, you have to do the, um, yeah, you do the set NS, so you, ha you fork, and then you do the FD passing to pass the. Yep. The, you pass it um, into the container. Pass it into the container, do the move, and then pass it back out somehow to like finalize the mount, right? Is that what it is? No, no, no. No, uh, so in this case, it's like you do the effort. So it depends on your file system. For most file systems that are only mountable in the, uh, uh, that require that they can only be mounted in initial user namespace, you need to do uh, create the super block uh, in the initial mount namespace because otherwise you won't be able to do it. So you do the FS open call because FS open is where um, the credentials and the relevant namespaces are recorded with some caveats. You no, know, it's complicated. And then you do the FS fig and the FS config command create creates the super block. Then a super block exists. Then, so then you turn that super block. Well, actually, when you before you do that fs command fig, uh, fs config command create, you only have a file system context that records information about the super block. Afterwards, this fs config command create turns it into a super block that actually exists, and fs mount turns this uh, fs context slash super block into a mount fd. So then it creates an, um, um, a VFS mount, and that VFS mount you can because it's a detached mount, you can send it into a container and you can t attach it anywhere you like. So okay, so that's what it is. Is I have to open the FS, fork, put myself in the mount namespace and the network namespace, do the mount part because that's the only way I can yep. access the network through yep. there, and then um, send that FD into the containers namespaces. Right. And, and then the only thing that matters from that point onwards is, uh, do you have permissions to mount in that mount namespace, and is it a detached mount so you can attach it any way you like? Right. Um, so that was bonkers, right? And like, you know, I <laughs> like this is not like a criticism, right? No, no, like, no. I mean, like this is fucking hard. Like this shit is hard, and there's not a really good way to do it. But like now that we've, like now that we are using this, right? Like consistently, and that I had to sit down and like follow this, and then I had to find somebody else's code that had actually like done it, because I still from this couldn't glean the order of operations, right? Like I feel like this is a rel not common, but like a well used. It is. Thing, um, is there a way we could do this in a less? Yeah, we would. Now that we know, right? Like, is there a way we could clean up this API? Do you think? So the biggest problem with this is the the credential slash permission management uh, um, uh, with all of this. Uh, I had experimented with various ways of making uh, this nicer. You, you, you need to somehow prove that you are able to actually uh, create that mount or that the, the original task that created that uh, super block has the right permissions to actually create that super block, which requires checking capabilities uh, in a specific uh, 
in a specific set of credentials. Yeah, we could possibly play around with recording credentials at FS open time and then somehow checking that in the container so that you can do it all inside of the container, but it would still require you to do the initial, uh, the initial, uh, the initial FS open in the initial namespaces. The permission model for this is what really fucks this up. It's not like that's what makes it difficult, like the user namespace part and the unprivileged mounting part. That's the disgusting stuff. Right, and that's the thing is like I sort of wish that we could just, not that like, not that I want to do it completely within the container because I think that that creates more problem, like more risk for us to fuck it up. Problems, yeah. Right. So like more that I wish that I could just simply from outside the container inject a mount. Right. So like I say, instead of like having to do like this so back and forth. Oh, uh, so so yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, so like a t so say like I know what the network namespace, I know what the <laughs> and pass it into my FS config Yeah, we, I mean, there is an obvious solution to this problem. It's, uh, we, well, it's not an obvious solution, but uh, uh, it's, like a, it's like a system call that David Howells, uh, we talked about this a long time ago, once proposed, which is like mount into container, uh, which is essentially, it, it does all of the, the set and as magic and so on uh, for you internally. So, which would probably have to be a, a new system call, which wouldn't be all that bad. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not against this, like containers are such a concept that it actually makes sense. Although then you get into a debate, what actually is a container? But anyway, it would have to be, uh, well, we, I'm seriously. Oh yeah, I, like I, th I think that like sidestepping that thing, like we have all of these, like the FS config thing. So if we just like added a command that says like, this is my destination mountain namespace. This is my destination network namespace. This is my destination. Oh, we could. Because it needs to be reliable against a PID. We could at FS configs record, for example, a PID of the of the uh, of the target process, yeah. uh, and then you have all of the namespace information that is attached to the PID of the. This something like this could work. It's just a matter of actually making it nice. Right. Uh, like I just I think that again now that we've done it and now that we have it, it's like okay, well this is. The kind problem, yeah. the problem is at move, at move mount time, you don't have the FS context information anymore. The only thing that you have left is uh, 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 basically a path. Sure, that's true. That's kind of annoying. Yeah, that's a problem. So it might still require a new sort of uh, a new API. Yeah, something instead of instead of move mount, we have like move container mount or something that like, and we maintain the the context the entire time. Or F instead of FS mount into container. I mean, well, so I, I wonder how much of this could be soluble if there was like higher level library code that like implemented, you know, one simple conception of what a container is without <laughs> necessarily saying it's the only way you can do containers, but. At the very least, it would be a convenient set of libraries. And for people who had strong opinions about some other definition of a container, it would serve as yeah. example code. So not, uh, right. so, by the way, I was just laughing at the, 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 the amount of uh, discussion we had around this uh, um, over the years. So um, something like this kind of, uh, kind of exists, like uh, system D's, um, Lena talked about this work last, uh, here and that work is now actually implemented. So it was sort of the, the same problem. Um, you want to mount an image inside of the container, uh, how to make it nice, uh, and uh, he sort of does exactly this. It abstracts it all away so that you can just call uh, mount inside of the container and then you mount an image if it's, uh, if it's structured. So it abstracts all of this away uh, using that API so you don't uh, have to do any of this. But I think what you are getting is you want to do it like a direct API user, essentially. You don't want to rely on tools. You do this right. programmatically, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that because that was kind of the thing, right, is like, you know, obviously I had a, the, this scheme was implemented in our container management system. Mm. The scheme was implemented in Docker, it's implemented in system D, right, but like, I'm a file system developer trying to fix a bug. I don't like have the, like, I'm not gonna set up all the scaffolding for like a container management thing. Like, I'm just going to init the container and then I want to do my mount. And then, so like I had to write a C program and then that C program to do this is, 
you know, using every... Like, yeah, we have a massive... Uh, Can we, we put an example set of code in the tools directory? Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, I also written a lot of that. A lot of that code is, must have been and it must be an XFS uh, test as well. Yeah. And you take a look. But I, I, I crypt all the user space mount stuff from the stuff that's in XFS tests. Yeah. I've used. So I mean, if it's in the tools directory, it's in the actual kernel tree. Um, and there's your example code. Yeah, I mean, like I can definitely yeah, post that. Yeah, that like <laughs> mine is. So the not pleasantly so named, the, but <clears throat> the the issue with making that nice is <clears throat> is that independent of uh, what actually a, a container is, because we have these many namespace types, and for example, in your example, you care about the network namespace, the mount namespace, and possibly the user namespace, and we have no single entity to actually refer to this uh, to this set of namespaces. PIDFD sort of work because I implemented, for example, SETNS for, for uh, PIDFDs. Uh, so it takes the namespaces from from the tasks that it, re uh, that it refers to. But other than that, like to build an API where we say mount, uh, mount into a container, for example, so you don't have to deal with any of this complexity, it would require having some sort of identifier, some sort of like, handle on on that thing that you want to mount into. And like we have been going about this for the last 10 years, uh, probably. And there is strong opposition by some people against having a first class container concept in the kernel. But if we had that, it is like this would be a non-starter problem, because then we had proper APIs for to actually inject mounts into containers directly. I, and, I, like, and so that brings me to my next thing, which like I know that there's like a lot of history here. Um, but like having to debug more and more of these container style things, right? Especially with mount namespaces, like uh, the fact that I can, like, there's super blocks. Like the problem that I was running into with NFS, right, is like we had stale leftover super blocks just floating around, and there's like no way for me to find these on a system other than I have to use Dragon. Like Dragon has to go in and manually walk data structures inside the kernel in order to find these fucking super blocks, which is bonkers. Now I get like, don't get me wrong, I understand like the whole first class citizen of container stuff, but like it, we're kind of getting to this point where this shit is unusable without being a kernel developer. And even the kernel developer that has to go debug it is real angry when he has to pull out Dragon just to get this kind of information. Yeah. Did you just uh, come up with a lightning talk for the plan? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Like I, I think this is, like obviously that this specific is, thing is outside of LSFMM BPF. But uh, yeah, I'm starting to feel this pain a lot more and it's not, not great. Yeah, I, I was going to just say, um, I very much have been wanting first class, like, namespaces everywhere, right? whether or not we have a container, um, first class container, which I actually personally believe containers are now mature enough that we should probably come up with one. The problem is, I'm not sure what would be the best venue to make sure we have all of the people associated with it because namespace is so distributed, right? Like. You know, the networking namespace, like the networking people feel like they own part of that. And in order to actually get all of the people to agree to make all the namespaces first class and have a container, like, I think we need to figure out how do we, like, corral all of those people. Is that a plumber's mini conf? I don't know. But I certainly would direly, dearly love to have something like that because, yeah, otherwise we're using Dragon to find these orphan namespaces, and that sucks. <laughs> You know, and I think, like, having had to do a lot of this recently, like, I'm not, like, I don't hate the individual implementations themselves. Like, the mount namespace makes sense, and then the network namespace makes sense, user namespace less so. But um, it is just now that we, it's, we're kind of at this point now where a lot of these tools, Docker, our internal stuff, you know, systemd to a certain degree has abstracted a lot of this, but when things go wrong, there's only so much those abstractions help because there's like no introspection into what the fuck is happening, right? And I feel, you know, and especially when it comes to mountain namespaces, I feel like there is a lifetime disconnect that I like didn't under, like I didn't appreciate properly. And which isn't doesn't appear to be documented anywhere. Where and so like it's not only just like we need to unify the way that we do this. So I'm not having to pull out Dragon, as much as I love Dragon. Um, 
but like also kind of like start to document some of these semantics so it's like less confusing and less surprising because like it was surprising to me that like I could have super blocks gone away and the mount namespace is just like the super block still there and the mount namespace is gone like it's the mount namespace got torn down properly and yet there's a super block that's still sitting there right and that was kind of like a surprising thing to me what was it pinned by sorry that's an interesting the so the the mount the super block was pinned because it was nfs and um this is super fun uh nfs obviously like there were dirty pages we ended up p killing the the container process which tears everything down um the super block doesn't pin the mountain namespace so when everything goes away the mount, mount namespace disappears but the super block is left behind because it's still you know, trying to contact the server on the back end. Oh, so you're being bitten by the fact that uh, the, the the NFS superblock is kept alive by the network namespace. So it's not kept alive by the network namespace. It's kept alive because it's, uh, <laughs> we, the order, when you P kill the container, the VTAP interface goes down. So it, ex, it ex, um, Oh my God, you dis, really have. It disconnects the network. Gone into the weeds. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, so it's super, it's super fun, but but like, like I I recognize that this problem is a Joseph problem. That one I'm not like asking us to solve. It's just like oh surprise, like I couldn't find a mount namespace for it because it it the mount namespace is not pinned by anything other than the applications using it. So that you have a super block that's just kind of sitting out there and the nothing. And that was a surprising thing to me, right? Yeah, LSNS works, but not in this case, because again, the, the namespace has, has disappeared, right? Okay. It sounds like the classic, you know, yeah, Superblock still exists so after it's been easy, unmounted, and right. you get busy, be busy for various operations from remounting. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry. I'd just like to say that no introspection is a bug. If you can't see what's going on, how do you even know when shit's broken? Yeah. I build massive amounts of introspection into all my code, and as a result, I am regularly able to dispense with bug reports in like 10 or 15 minutes. The introspection and the sort of the making it a first class object it has, uh, a lot of people wanted this, but uh, for reasons it didn't happen. <laughs>